So to kick us off, um, it would be lovely to hear from you folks about who you are and what you do, what, what are you selling for those of you that sell things and anything you'd like to share. Awesome. Um, Evan McCann, I work as an advisor with Faskin, which is a Canadian law firm. Uh, I am not a lawyer, but I work with the two partners here in Calgary, helping our tech clients with anything they need. Background, uh, launched and ran sales teams at Benevity, Neo Financial, Headversity, and some stuff with Thin Air Labs as well. My name's David Nagy. I'm the founder of an organization called E-Commerce Canada. Uh, it's a consulting service that helps people make money on the internet, essentially. So uh, my background is in retail and online retail uh, predominantly. So I've uh, run a bunch of companies selling different products, different services on the internet. So today I play more in the B2B service offering side, but historically I've been a bit of an online sales hustler. So I'm a founder that sells to people. And I'm Kelsey Hahn. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Monarch. We are headquartered in Calgary. We are a digital leadership development and performance platform. Um, we work primarily with kind of scaling and growing organizations and with new and first-time leaders, um, typically kind of five to ten years in their first leadership position. Um, what else can I say? We're a team of 18 approximately, and we're founded by organizational psychologists. My partner is actually a grad um, from the University of Calgary Psychology School. Thank you. Um, maybe that wasn't a good, maybe I'll just keep that mic there and, and I'll, I'll, I'll use this one. Um, but so thank you for your introductions. I'm curious as you kind of go through your journey, whether that's being consulting or um, whatever, whatever else. Um, how would you describe kind of the stages of your sales funnel um, for those of you that are kind of selling right now um, and for those of you that are kind of more consulting, what have you observed as kind of good sales, sales funnels for startups? Who'd like to start? <laughs> um, parts of the sales. Yeah, I guess with should we be looking at it from, like, I guess what kind of perspectives of sales funnel should we look at that? Let's go with all of them. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it is a big question. And I guess for, for some context, my roles have always kind of been on the B2B side, uh, usually somewhat enterprise or mid-market. Uh, at Neo, sometimes kind of more SMB. Um, so I... I I, I just break it down into, into three stages, right? There's kind of like the outbound prospecting part of it. Then you kind of have your deal flow. Then you have your closing. So, uh, yeah, that's I would just kind of have three main buckets. I don't like to overcomplicate it, but that's kind of how I would look at it. And we, and we, and we can break that down a bit more. I'll, yeah, I'll break it down a bit more then. Just uh, uh, because I've been in marketing for so many years, I really worry about the acquisition funnel, you know. Um, we'll talk about attribution, I think, during this session. Um, but I really need to see what a prospect flow looks like, right? Like how robust is my business in the market? Even before we get to the next phase, it would be like qualification or pre-qualification. Are they even good customers? Should we even be talking to these people? Um, I, but I like to create an acquisition problem first, if I'm being honest. I don't know what everybody's business is in the room, but sometimes we get overly focused on like pre-qualifying customers when we don't have any prospects in a pipeline. So I'm like, I'd rather be flooded by prospects and stressed out by that, solve that problem through, you know, building barriers. Um, but, you know, the acquisition part, I think, is, is just so, so, so essential. And then we qualify people, and then you get paperwork or proposals or conversion sales funnels established. Uh, you sell to them, and then you need to retain and nurture and keep making money off those leads so you don't have to continue to acquire brand new ones. Yeah, so I'm... I'm, we're actually building this right now, and, and so I'm learning um, kind of in real time how we're setting this up. I think, I, I don't think a lot of you were here for the last session, but we talked a lot about like the different um, CRMs and tools we use. So we use HubSpot, um, and we're B2B SaaS, and we're typically selling annual licenses, you know, five to six figures for an, um, an annual contract. And so that, you know, the, the your actual ACVs, so your, um, annual customer value, that changes 
um, your sales process, and it, and it should, right? And so I think everyone should be a little bit aware of that. But so for us, that means we don't even move you into our sales funnel. Like our first stage of sales funnel is like you've engaged with us at a touch point and we've had that first meeting. So kind of like after the first meeting, once we've qualified, now you're into the funnel um, and kind of like how do we move you through? Um, basically our next step, usually after an initial call and there's interest expressed, maybe pricing has already come up so that they can kind of assess whether it'll be a good fit, whether they have budget. Um, we move into a demo. Um, demo um, sometimes done with the champion internally. Um, sometimes after that it's a second demo with a broader team and a broader presentation. Um, getting alignment from kind of like multiple layers in the organization. Sometimes, you know, whoever your champion buyer is going up and below, right? I think that's kind of an enterprise approach is you want to be touching multiple different um, stakeholders in the organization. From there, um, we start to move towards like pricing discussions. We get a proposal together. We get, um, and that's really after like being able to attune the proposal, I would say, to what we heard in the last few meetings around, you know, what exactly the client wants. And then, um, and then we go into an evaluation stage where there might be negotiation on price. Um, Oh, you know, I think this is actually really critical for early stage companies in general. Don't be afraid of your price moving. Um, I don't think any of you are my clients in the room, but almost all of our clients have different pricing. <laughs> um, because it's a negotiation, right, at the end of the day. And um, just depending on where people are at and, you know, what kind of logo are they, I mean, you're willing to make certain concessions, right? I have clients that are paying a little bit less because they let us be super invasive on, like, getting feedback from them and using them as a case study. So, um, that's a key part of it, is actually attuning your pricing to what they're willing to pay. Um, and then hopefully we're moving to a decision point and, and from there, close one or close lost, really important to record why one, why lost, um, so that you can really dig into that data after. And then after that, if they're closed one, we move them into our customer success pipeline. So now they start on a one, one year contract where there's different touch points among our customer success team. So the funnel, you know, that I just talked about the sales pipeline, but we also have a pipeline once we've won the account. Very good, thank you. Um, Do you have anything to add? Yeah, just, just to expand a little bit. I, th I think when we're talking about the sales process up here, I think there's kind of the usual you know, prospecting, discovery, demo, you probably have some sort of kind of price negotiation call and a closing call. That is kind of a stereotypical sales process, but um, I think it's different for every organization. Like some organizations that sell more of like, you know, what I call a mid-market product, or maybe it's only a few thousand dollars, maybe that demo and discovery call is actually on the same call. Um, so th don't, just because there's like a stereotypical sales structure, you should make the process work really well for your business, but also work really well for your prospect or potential client. So you should make it easy for them. If they have to sit in on 20 calls and it's like a small, medium business, they're probably going to not want to work with you. If you're selling to Loblaw, like, yes, you're probably going to have 15, 20 sales calls. So I think just adapt the sales process so that it aligns really well for you and your business and speed, but also works well for your buyer as well. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, based on my kind of discussions before we began, I, be I, would, I believe um, that a lot of folks in the room are probably interested in that kind of prospect part, like getting the first person to hear about you and to kind of move them along that funnel. Um, so my apologies, I didn't prepare you for this question. But um, any advice or strategies that you currently use um, on how to get people at the beginning of your pipeline? Um, yeah, again, for context, I usually kind of operate in that kind of B2B space, selling some sort of product there. So I think when it comes to prospect, I think prospecting is one of the most important things you can do in the sales process, really kind of identifying um, who that buyer is. Are they a high quality buyer? Do you think they would actually buy your product? I think what a lot of people will just do is they'll just download some list off the internet or, you know, like let's say you're selling to oil and gas companies, they would just pull like a random file of like who works at these companies and then just mass email them. I really think prospecting is important. Um, I think like a good example, Headversity, we're selling a mental health kind of software, B2B. So you really had to dig in the organization using tools like LinkedIn Sales Navigator, 
you know, reaching out to different people at the organization and really trying to figure out, okay, who is the, the top buyer for this product? Because it usually wasn't always like the VP of HR. It could be a unique title in that organization. So I really think prospecting is what makes and breaks your sales process. If you put, uh, you know, I don't want to use this term, but if you put garbage leads in, you're probably going to have garbage on the other end. Whereas if you take a lot of time and energy and prospect correctly, you're going to have a higher quality kind of sales process. And and leads take up a lot of time. It's a lot of energy. You're a startup. Like, that's important. So if you're putting your time into high quality things. Also, if, if you're really hand selecting those people from a prospecting standpoint, you're probably going to be more driven to get them on board. And you know that they have that need because you've really done your due diligence on it. Yeah, I think dovetailing on that, um, it's being very conscious of who that customer is. I see a lot of early stage businesses that just don't draw up a persona very well of who their customer is, who that decision maker may be, whether it's D to C or B to B. I call it casting where the fish are swimming, right? <laughs> like there's no point fishing if you have not identified the water where something attractive could happen. And I think at an early stage, a lot of, you know, small businesses, early stage entrepreneurs, um, hopefully nobody in this room, they just haven't gone through the rigors of trying to figure out who that customer is and how they live their lives, even more so than like what's their job title per se, but what are things of influence within them, right? Is this a good networking uh, event to attend today because I believe that there's going to be qualified people here, right? So just kind of doing that work to identify a persona, how they spend their time, where they live their lives, allow me to cast where the fish are swimming so that there is that efficacy downstream of it. You'll ultimately blame marketing for bad results. Yeah. And it's typically not marketing per se. It's lack of marketing efficacy, right? Mm -hmm. We have to spend a lot of money. You don't have to waste a lot of time. You just need to be super laser, laser focused, right? So just a little additional due diligence before you're kind of in market trying to find people. Um, <clears throat> how many, so of the entrepreneurs in the room, how many are pre-revenue? Okay, there's a few. Um, I mean, just, just to your point, David, I, I would say we were the opposite of that. We did not know who our persona was in the beginning. And, you know, we're, we're a... So we're a, we're a company that can sell across multiple verticals. Almost virtually most companies in the world today have some sort of leadership development program. So it was initially like really hard for us to figure out, is there one vertical we should be um, going after? And, and so this is like maybe a little bit unique to my business, but I would say the orientation in the early days was just like, just sell. Don't worry about who you're selling to um, or even specifically what you're selling. Get out and validate and prove that someone will pay you for something that, you know, ideally your business idea, the business you're trying to create. Um, then you'll learn because I would say like now we're at the point where I could walk into, I said this to an investor this morning, which I was like, oh, I'm really happy we're at that stage. But we could have a first prospecting call and I could basically... I could predict if we're gonna land that sale or not because you just know your persona so well, which is like, this company has budget, um, this person is talking in the right way. You know, you see all the characteristics that you've seen before. And so you, you're able to, I would say that for us, having enough of the experiences that went well and some that went wrong gave me the ability to create this pattern recognition over time of like, which are the ones that really go right versus I would say, for us, spinning our wheels over who do we think this persona is versus just going out and like testing it and, and figuring out and the, mar the market and your customers will tell you. But that is, you know, I would say that's unique to early stage. Thank you. Um, it kind of brought up a point that came up in our kind of pre-discussions about using data. So moving people along the sales funnel, um, what I gathered from our conversation is, of course, you know, kind of personalities and communication styles and so on is important, but process and using data um, to accomplish your goals is also important. Um, thoughts on that, especially as it relates to using some of the findings you found in your experience selling before to kind of fine tune who you're selling to now. Yeah, so for us to move them through the funnel, um, I mean, we're starting to layer in 
more tech around, you know, where are they, like connecting and where do our customers hit on our website? Um, which emails are they opening? So, you know, I think like generally we're creating a drip campaign to keep those like initial qualified leads um, interested and engaged. We're using white papers, blogs, um, lots of things like that, I think, which would be kind of... Um, not unique to B2B sales. Um, and once we're keeping them in the funnel, like now I would say we're getting to the point where we're able to like, this is why I said analyzing your closed one and closed loss. Like if you have companies hanging out in your funnel, so you're like, well, they might come back, close them off. <laughs> um, you can always bring them back into the funnel if they, if they do come back. Um, but I'm trying to basically, you know, make sure that our HubSpot is the source of truth. So, I, I would say in the last six months, we've been guilty of this kind of, we've had a lot of conversations on our sales team kind of like walking around and saying, well, we heard this and then this customer said this and then, and then we went to this conference and they were talking about this and you can get really like shiny dog, you know, syndrome or shi what, shiny object syndrome, not a shiny dog. Um, <laughs> <laughs> although that would probably, yeah, a shiny dog, shiny puppy maybe. Um, but when we're having all these conversations, we're like, should we be pivoting? You kind of like go back to, no, no, what is the source of truth? And if it's in HubSpot and if they're a customer, um, go back to the data that you have that has reinforced that they're paying for what you will, what you have. Um, and so doing that, I think, has really allowed us to like hone back in on, yeah, really like who are those personas? Um, also just like for us, recognizing that like we're playing at a certain like mid-market level and we're not ready for enterprise yet, but we will be, you know, at a certain point in time. So I think it's for, yeah, it's just kind of all based on where you're at. Mm -hmm. uh, data can cause paralysis as well. So when you're, you know, pre-revenue or early stage, it's probably not as prudent. Just like very basic things like um, spreadsheet trackable stuff. Uh, you know, how many prospects do I have? Customer lifetime value and customer acquisition costs are the two metrics that I fixate on a lot or at least coach people. It's like, yeah, know those two. <laughs> if you don't know anything else, know those two because level of effort, you know, you had kind of quoted some numbers or five or six figure. Uh, a customer, you know, essentially a prospect, that's the net value to us. It's important to know that and to know it relatively intimately so you can figure out how to budget time and marketing acquisition costs towards it, right? Is there a line in the sand there where it's just like, okay, it's not worth a certain level of effort at a certain point? Mm -hmm. We see it a lot in retail. Um, you know, it's like you've, you've got fairly fixed net margins and a customer's got a purchase frequency. And once you see enough data, you just know that I can't spend X on an AdWords click mm -hmm. to earn that particular customer. It's harder to determine all that when you're, when you're selling enterprise or B2B because uh, the sales cycle's so long. But I, you know, early stage, very, very simple data. And try not to get paralyzed by the sheer volume that you can have when you are using a tool like Salesforce or HubSpot. So much human management, right? Like assessing the maturity and stage of, of, a, of a lead and where they're at in that particular purchase cycle. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that's on like the owners and the salespeople and organization, make sure that's all up to date, so you gotta keep it clean to, cause garbage in equals garbage out, right? So if you're not looking at, at good numbers, you're gonna trick yourself, mm -hmm. so. Um, I, well, I think the, the first thing with data is like, you need to at least be tracking it. If you're just sending out emails, doing random phone calls, and you're not even tracking that in like a Google Sheet or something, and measuring your success rate, your open rate, there's lots of easy tools out there that you can kinda, plug in that are relatively free or cost effective to track these things because if you're not even tracking what's working on the outbound side then it's going to be really hard like later in the sales process then I think just assigning kind of data and like conversion rates to each part of your sales process so if you do have that kind of stereotypical sales rate it's like okay well we reached out to 100 folks we booked 20 discovery meetings and then 20 discovery meetings led to five demos and then you know so you're just tracking that kind of conversion I think you should also be measuring the time between those steps. Like if it takes you, um, again, you know, if it takes you six months to close a client, but you're just, you're in that space where maybe the contract value is 50K, like that's quite quick. If it takes you six months to close someone and it's $500 or $100, maybe that's way too long. So every business is very different. 
but basically you want to track those conversion rates and then from a data perspective, uh, time to close I think is, is super, super valuable. There, there's thousands of metrics you can do, but I think if you are really early, again, it's just establishing a baseline. That's what you're trying to do with the sales process is establish a baseline and then you know when someone's in the sales process, are they on track? Are they off track? And like, how do we get them back on track? You want to create, you know, the world's not perfect. You're never going to have it absolutely perfect, but you want to create a sales process that is almost perfect. And you want to keep everyone on that track. Uh, harder, sa harder said than done, but like, that's kind of how you want to think about it. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I'll just add to, um, you, like you mentioned timing. I think that's like really important. Um, I think a little bit like as you move up market into bigger organizations, you do really want to understand their buying timelines. Like organizations have budgets. For many of them, you have to fit into a budget. They're not going to get approval if you don't. Understand when are they setting new budgets? When do you need to have these conversations? Um, and then also like if it's a no in April, understand, oh, okay, so you're, so you're doing budgets in September. Make sure that you're getting that data in your pipeline, right? And then keeping them warm until then. Um, because, yeah, and that would just be like the last point. There's been lots of customers where it's a no today, fine, keep them warm, and they have come back to us in two to three months when they're ready. And so we take them out of the pipeline, right? Um, but if they come back and, you know, you had a good relationship, you gave them all of the assets you needed, they've, you know, maybe they've been watching your progress on LinkedIn, so they're seeing you're growing, they're seeing your new features, you're teasing them, right? Um, they'll come back to you, hopefully. Mm -hmm. That's a great lead up to my next question, which is what are some kind of tools and strategies that you use to nurture people along your sales funnel? Um, and I guess when you have to take them out, how do you pull them back in? If okay. you would like to. I'll jump in. I'm on HubSpot as well with my current business, but I've used a multitude of different tools over the years. So um, pick the right one for you. I think a lot of what we're talking about up here is this very pipeline sort of view tools, right? Like pipe drive or HubSpot or Salesforce to do this stuff too. So what you're seeing there is these stages of maturity for leads and we can call them cards or, you know, you're, you're moving people along maturity or you're booting them out altogether. But you can do a lot of this with pretty simple tools, right? You can use a Google sheet and just track it for yourself. And that's a great way to start. You don't need to, don't invest in software that, um, isn't going to be used every day is, you know, kind of a good rule of thumb because inevitably if, you know, you're a solopreneur, you may adopt it, but you ultimately have to teach other people how to use it. And that's where the whole deck of cards starts to fail. Um, document processes, right? I think if you're a founder led business, you can keep it all up here and you kind of ruminate on it. You don't sleep at night. And so you're Every lead is in your brain on what you're going to do with them tomorrow morning. You're thinking about it and obsessing about this stuff all the time. No one else that you transfer this responsibility to will ever quite feel the same way. Even though there's great people out there, it's, it's just never going to be as close to them. So I have an operations manager right now that scares me with her ability to document a process, which I can't do because I'm a visionary. I just like scribble on napkins and think that, well, Evan, you can sell this, right? It can't be that hard, <laughs> but it is hard, right? There's 25 steps to the process, a long sales cycle like, like Kelsey's. I mean, there's a billion things that have to happen and emails that are triggered and ways of communicating, you know, it's the tonality of the email that goes out on the third engagement and things like that are quite nuanced that an entrepreneur or founder will kind of get because it's gut instinct, but really, really hard for other people to execute in the same way that you would. So I think as a, as a you know, suspicious business owner, I'm always like, I want visibility, man. I want to see what's going on and how we're talking to people. And that's where a tool like HubSpot can be really useful to you. But you can also just have an email marketing tool, right? Have a, have a MailChimp, have a Klaviyo, something like that. Um, I, th I, th I think for me, I just want to add a, like a bit of context on terms of nurturing. So, um, my thought process is like, if you have like four people on your sales pipeline, like this just not enough. Like, I think you really got to focus on that top of funnel. You have enough volume coming through your sales pipeline. Cause if you're laser focused on a handful of deals and one of those doesn't work out, it could be detrimental to your business. So you want to make sure there's enough leads coming into that sales funnel. And then the way I look at it is someone's going through your sales process 
and you should be, every time you're having a meeting with them, you should be you know, trying to get to that next part of the sales process. And if they don't want to get there, you need to be honest with yourself and not just keep them in your dashboard because that number looks really attractive. Like it's just building off what Kelsey was saying of like, you want to close loss that person and close loss doesn't mean, hey, I think your product is shitty and I never want to see you again. Sometimes it could be, yeah, we're just not ready. Maybe we want to talk to you in six months, whatever that timing may be. And then you'll start to find common like lost like reasons, like why are they, why are they kind of following out of the sales process? Then have a drip funnel for each of those people. So if it's like, hey, not right now, in six months, okay, so I'm going to send them like one email a month or whatever that cadence may be. Or, you know, maybe it's they think it's too expensive or they're waiting for a certain feature. You can like backlog all these people and put them into specific nurture funnels that are based off why they fell out of your sales process. So that's where I nurture folks because otherwise like everyone should be active in your funnel. And if they're not, yeah, it's because they fell out for whatever reason. And then you have nurture for each of those. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so uh, you folks have kind of matured quite a bit, um, kind of Monarch and e-commerce um, in particular, um, but there was a, and sorry? And Faskins too. And Faskins too. Um, but there was a time when we didn't have HubSpots and we didn't have um, Zendesk and Salesforce and so on. Um, what was the difference between bootstrapping um, and kind of where you are now? Um, yeah, how, how do you create replicable processes for success and how did those processes kind of evolve over time? Yeah, I mean, we you kind of just touched on this, David, but I have a pretty, like, pretty clear kind of cut and dry view of this. And we had, today we have 25 customers, um, you know, at, so we've never had more than that in, the, in our four year history. So yeah, we were able to manage everything on a spreadsheet. I mean, we tracked a lot of the data that's in HubSpot, but I didn't need to buy HubSpot yet. Um, that was sufficient. But I would say like, you know, being ruthless about sales, I think so many tech companies fail because the founders cannot figure out how to sell the product. And I would really push you, like if you can't, if you're the founder and you can't sell the product, get it figured out ASAP. Um, because layering on your sales team, they're just, like you said, they're not gonna figure it out. Um, if you can't figure it out. <laughs> You're the one that has the intuition, the vision, the passion. Um, so you really have to figure out that market and who you're selling to. Um, and then you can start bringing teams in. I think another big mistake that companies make way too early is yeah, adding way too many um, salespeople or BDRs way too early. Um, the founder should be leading sales from the get-go. And that's always going to look a little bit different in every company. Um, but you need to figure out what you're creating and what the market wants, and then you'll be able to teach others. And so I would say that we've done that, and we're now really in the process of building out the sales team, and it's it's not without hiccups. Like, to your point, things that are very intuitive for me that kind of, like, just flow for me in terms of, like, actually it just happened this morning. I was like, oh, yeah, that customer, um, they probably need some assets from us to, like, communicate up to their boss. And my sales person didn't think about that, right? So it was just like, I'm thinking about it on my drive. And so, but then in my head, I'm like, got to add that into our sales process. Like, so that's a nurture point, like get the assets to them in between meetings, right? Ask them, do you want me to, can I help make a slide deck for you? Is there anything you need from me to communicate? So some of those like intuition points, um, yeah, just like salespeople aren't necessarily going to have. So I really, really push um, founders on that. I think, I think that was kind of your question. Yeah, no, it was good, it was good. Well, my scar heart skipped a beat when you said that, because I, I personally have never pulled it off where I could just offload the accountability of selling to somebody else at an early stage, right? It just, there's authenticity that comes around, there's familiarity, there's competitiveness, like you should always want to win. I talked to somebody on my team a few weeks ago, I wouldn't say who, I was like, are we writing the proposals or are we trying to win them? You know, it's a different mindset that goes into that. The task is not create the proposal or create the paperwork so we can look at it in PandaDoc and go, like, oh, that's, that's very exciting. Look at all the pent up opportunities we have. It's like, you got to put yourself in the customer's seat and say, like, what's appealing to them? How can I craft this in a way, whether it's through negotiation or scope or just be more appealing, you know, be that differentiated brand that's 
going to get that signature because that's the goal here, right? Sometimes your people are going through the exercise of saying, well, the work is done, the work is done. But it's like, well, no, the end result is the destination that we're looking for here. So, and it's a little tweak of mindset. Um, if you're more on the consumer side, I mean, I've sold a lot of different verticals. Uh, being authentically in that community, I think, helps the most. Like positioning your brand. Uh, some years ago, I ran an outdoor gear retailer, which, you know, we became big and had about 350,000 customers. But, I mean, our litmus test on understanding that community and that organ, we were everywhere that that audience participated, right? Not just hawking gear and selling our thing. We're content creators and guides and subject matter experts. And, you know, we had adventurers and people that we sponsored. So just like uber active, authentically, you know, like, like actually doing it because we gave a damn and that's where we want to be spending our time and the manifestation of sales and customer acquisition was kind of a byproduct of all that. So I think it's pretty important to connect with the community. It's pretty hard to sell something that you're not fully indoctrinated in or, or drinking that Kool-Aid. Um, I'll probably just talk a little bit about Neo from this side. Like I know Neo now has like raised 300 million, so maybe it's a bad example. But early days, you know, we were just using G Suite, just Gmail, Google Sheets, organizing everything like that. I think when it comes to kind of scaling, you'll know when you want to invest in a certain tool. So once your Google Sheet just becomes so overwhelming that you can't handle it, you know, upgrade to HubSpot or an equivalent type of kind of CRM tool. There's Apollo IO, which is really good. Um, I think there's some like base stuff that you just absolutely like you need to invest in it, right? Like if you want to spend zero dollars on tools, I, I don't think you're going to win, but you don't need to spend tens of thousands or more, uh, you know, a couple hundred having a budget and understanding what tools work really well for your specific industry. But yeah, bef uh, I joined around the seed round. We were just using G Suite. And we just kept layering things on. So, hey, we needed to have a better outbound, outbound tool. We added Sales Loft. Uh, we needed a better CRM. We implemented Salesforce. But we added those as at the scale that we needed them. And we almost waited till things absolutely almost broke before we put those things in. Maybe, again, that's not the best thing to do. But that's just kind of how things were. Um, and I think that's the best way to add a tool because you know like, like things are just going to break down and not work if we do not add this thing. So, um, yeah, you, you just made me think of something, too. Like, I, I think there is a school of thought where it's, like, it's very hard to um, add salespeople until your product or your brand really has kind of established market presence. And so I think this is just powerful to think about, which is, like, when you're thinking about hiring sales salespeople and growing your team, just, you know look at their experience and look at where they came from and what they've been selling because the things that um, traditional salespeople have in like large organizations that you won't have in a new tech company or otherwise, they have brand recognition, they have budget, they have all their sales assets, they have clear messaging, um, they probably have a team, they often have leads, they already have like a flow of leads that are coming in and so in, in at least with us, none of that exists, <laughs> right? And so you're creating that for the first time. And so without that kind of structure, it's hard for them to just like go out and execute. And sales is really creative, right? And so that's the only other thing is I would say is like, to your point, like you gotta do what you gotta do in the beginning. You, I think I've been surprised at how many, I just saw a, like a deck from a Series Z company <laughs> in the US, something that they do to like aid in the sale. And it was like mind blowing to me because I'm like, there's still so much that companies are doing outside of like what you see, which is just like go on the website, click purchase. There's so much more that's happening in the background in nurturing that sale and in customer success. So I would just, you know, keep that in mind too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we've spoken a lot about some strategies that we can have, you know, being in the community, um, agreed, um, you know, thinking about actually what problem you're solving um, with your product, who are they, uh, if right, right now is not the right time, um, when is the right time, and how do you have like a drip funnel for um, folks if you, if you have to take them outside of the funnel. Um, of course, we're in the social innovation hub, um, and so we care about the social good. Um, 
So how might some of these strategies or tactics differ for a company who perhaps are selling something to have a benefit to someone else or um, who's, you know, may not be only driven by profit or driven by impact? Um, I'm going to throw this to Kelsey because you do have a social um, innovation. Um, so yeah, feel free to take it away. <laughs> yeah, so we're actually part of UCED's portfolio under the Social Impact Fund. So um, yeah, very happy to talk about this. I mean, so a couple things. We seek partnerships um, and look to build relationships with like-minded organizations who potentially are servicing um, the, the, the groups that we want to support. So maybe um, new immigrants, maybe more women, um, basically um, groups or populations where we know they've previously not had access to leadership development. Um, so I think like that's number one is like always thinking about partnerships and working with kind of like-minded individuals. Um, secondly, from like a customer perspective, I would say we do very much bring the values and, and kind of the impact piece into sales. Um, we've walked away from sales from organizations that would not be the right fit. I think like, you know, to what I said earlier, like you can pretty much tell if this is going to be a great client or not because they already have the culture, the values. Um, typically, they're already investing in products like ours in their company. And if they're talking to us in a way that's like, well, I remember one customer said to us or one prospect was like, so when I get the data from your platform, can I use that to fire people? <clears throat> and I was like, you know, and we're like, okay, this is not going to be a good fit here. Um, and so, you know, I think being like really clear where your values line. And then now in the age of data, I would say we get those requests from clients all the time, you know, and I have to really work with our team around like what we can disclose and what we cannot disclose on like an employee confidentiality level, um, especially because what we do has the ability to impact um, someone's employment and their performance in their company. So we take all of that extremely seriously. And ultimately when we find the right fit and like clear values alignment, those concerns aren't there. And so for us, that's very much part of the prospecting process. Like we're looking at organizations or um, channels where those organizations are more likely to show up. Um, B Corp, the B Corp list or B Corp certified organizations is one example. Thank you for that. Go yeah, ahead. I, I think profit and purpose or married objectives anyway, right? It's not faceless objects that we're selling things to. It's still humans on the other side. And they usually want to align. I mean, what do we spend money on? I, the things and people that we like at the end of the day. We want relationships that are meaningful. Regardless of the output, I think this is even in commercial ventures. At the end of the day, we usually choose to spend our, our dollars with the contractor that we liked or the person that seemed to have expertise that was appealing to us. So, uh, Certainly decision making isn't as easy as like, that's the thing that'll cost the less or make me the most money. There has to be an alignment of purpose and Kelsey's someone who, who won't take on a client because they don't kind of kind of match. But we all feel that energy. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, just kind of knowing your customer extremely well and understanding what appeals to them. And if you understand your purpose of, of what you do, you kind of find those relationships a lot easier. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think for like social impact ventures, I don't have a ton of experience with this, but I think at the end of the day, if you're not selling maybe a product with a dollar amount and maybe it's more you're kind of selling impact or you have an organization, you still are selling. You're maybe not selling something with a dollar amount, but you still are selling yourself, the brand you've built, um, the impact that you're having, um, whether you're looking for sponsorship or partnerships out there in the community. I think you are still selling. Maybe that what you're selling or how you sell is slightly different. Um, but again, I, I think everyone's selling, like, again, if you're a founder and you're getting someone to join your team, you're selling them on your company. If you're getting an investor, you're basically selling equity in your company to get money from them. So you're always selling. The nature of what you're selling is different, but I think you, as a founder, you just really need to understand, um, what David said, just of like that understanding people and like what emo motivates them and what drives them and like at, es at, the, at its essence, that's what sales is, so. Um, I'm curious as well, how kind of would you define success differently perhaps? Um, maybe I'll throw this one to you as well, Kelsey. Um, of, of course, we're all business people, like we do want 
to sell something. <laughs> um, but does success look differently if you're an impact organization versus if you're not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for us, I mean, we track so many data points and, uh, you know, I would... I would encourage every company in the room to getting as much data as you can from your customers, as much as they'll let you. Um, we, we really do <laughs> try to get as much as we can. Um, and we're tracking everything for us from like, um, what is the population in your organization? So what are your demographics? We do these like demographic surveys and then we look at the demographics of the users that we're serving. We report out on our user base. Um, we report out on, um, on the opportunities that they're getting within their organizations because they've had access to Monarch's platform. Um, we report out on the tenure, um, yeah, and just kind of the different groups that we're serving and what they've previously had access to. So we find that 87% of our users have never had any form of leadership training before. And so, you know, that's a really meaningful statistic to us. And then the second thing is um, we very closely track, so we're, we're organizational scientists by training, and so we track um, outcomes, like, religiously. Um, you know, and I, I think the world, like, is just becoming, we're becoming really picky with our dollars. You know, there's so many options and I think that that's coming into everyone's business. Like, you have to be able to prove the ROI on your product. And if you can tell that story with data, it's almost irrefutable. And so, um, yeah, we're really trying to show the behavior change and the metrics that ultimately the champions and the buyers want to see. Um, and so, being diligent to collect that data upfront and report out on it consistently is really important. Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I mean, I can, I can. <laughs> uh, I'll plug a local company that is a purpose-driven organization, but a for-profit venture. I had the opportunity to work at the founders of Rocky Mountain Soap Company for a number of years. Um, and, you know, on the surface, it's a commercial venture, it's a retail company, but their BHAG is to, oh, I'll never forget this, right, is to remove toxins from the Canadian skincare industry. It was drilled into my psyche because as a consultant, I was pushed constantly by that leadership team to bring them ideas to sell and grow revenue. And, but yeah, but it all had to go through the lens of removing toxins from the Canadian skincare industry, certainly for social good. Um, Every decision had to go through that filter, and that's fundamentally what connected them and endeared them to so many people. Now, still running a commercial enterprise that you need to be profitable so you can create all those products and jobs. But their understanding of their purpose was their grounding point, right? Like every decision in the organization came down to that. Like when in doubt, ask yourself that question. The work that you're doing today, does it achieve that? The, the commercial enterprise was a secondary benefit, a byproduct of achieving that particular goal. And I think most of us as business people, yeah, we're commercially minded. I mean, we want to go out there and be successful and make some money and hopefully make, hopefully make a lot of money one day. But I don't think we enter into this without the belief that we're trying to change the world in some particular way. I'll probably just take my time out. Benevity. Benevity is doing well over 100 million a year, um, but I think, you know, has created a huge impact. And I think important to what Kelsey mentioned is they track that data point, those data points in the product, the impact that's had, and they shout it from the rooftops. Like I'm sure everyone sees it on LinkedIn or social media or any other type of media. Benevity really pushes the impact that they have. They really shout that from the rooftop. And I think similar to the point that David said is, it's just within the organization. Anyone who gets hired at that organization, you go through kind of a, a week kind of training onboarding session where you get aligned with the values of the company. And and if, if you're not a good fit or like it's not, a, like people self-select and like don't join, right? So I think there's that external impact of like, okay, this business makes a lot of money, is very successful, um, but also telling the impact that they have and then also creating an impact within you know, I think roughly 800, over 1,000 people now work there. Um, so, you know, like also just creating an impact in the community within the organization. Mm -hmm. So what I'm gathering is being very clear on what your kind of North Star is and making sure you're anchoring your decisions into that. And not only will that help you make decisions, but it can also potentially help you get customers too because um, you want to work with people that align with the same values that you have. Um, well, I have one final question for you, and then we'll open it up to Q&A, so start thinking about your, um, your questions. Um, but kind of as you've go gone through this journey, um, 
how do you tell your story? You know, how do you get the message out about your work and what you're doing? Um, I mean, having prospects is one thing, but communicating with them is, is different. Um, so yeah, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. What has been your experience? Um, I, I think to get your message out, I think it's just really like, like where do your prospects live? And again, it's what David mentioned earlier. We talked about this in our last chat of like, really not knowing your ICP and your persona. And your persona should be more than a job title. It should be like where are these these people, who these people are, right? Like what kind of similarities do they have? Do they have families? Do they you know, work, work out at a certain location? Do they spend their evenings at a certain location? Like I think that's a really important thing to get in front of folks and what makes it unique. Cause you know, there's the stereotypical channels of, you know, email and cold call and all these things, which I, I are still very effective and you need them. But I think especially early days, if you're pre-revenue, it's just really understanding like the people that you're looking to get in front of, where do they hang out? What kind of groups are they doing uh, evening events? Is there kind of different organizations in town that you can kind of, they've already built that kind of network and you can kind of tap into it. So I think um, there are, probably like the group of people you're trying to get in front of is probably already gathering in some method, whether digitally or in person and finding ways to kind of break into that is, is super useful. I certainly can't say it any better than that. That's, that's spot on. And it's something that, you know, personally I'm terrible at. Uh, do not do it. Not good at many things. Don't do a whole lot in terms of self-promotion because it's, it's, it's hard and it's daunting and we're Canadians and we're humble and we don't like to do those things. Um, but, you know, I think just being generous with your time, being generous with your intellectual property, right? Sure, we can monetize these things, but what good is it if we're not sharing it with the broader universe, right? And people tend to appreciate that and they respect that. So, you know, be present, be up on a stage, do what you do on LinkedIn. I'm not very good at social media at all, but you know, try and share as much of that message as you can, I think is the, the long-term goal and how you have the, the biggest impact on the, the greatest number of people. Um, <clears throat> so for us, we, you know, I really look at, um, I look at our success, uh, like my success as, a, as an individual and as a business as like, you are the company you keep, right? And so, I want to work with amazing clients and I want clients to say that about their experiences with us. And, you know, when we've looked at our most successful acquisition tool, it unquestionably is word of mouth or um, customer referrals. And this just happened the other day. We lost a customer a year ago and I just got an amazing referral from that customer that we lost, you know? And so I'm like, thank you for that referral. You don't even work with us anymore. Um, but obviously, you know, still thought highly of us and our name came up in conversation. You cannot like underestimate in certain businesses how powerful that word of mouth and kind of like external validation is for buyers. Um, it's just, it's very important in our space. So I just think that we're meticulous around kind of like our reputation and delivering on the customer experience, um, especially in these early days. Um, and then, yeah, on thought leadership, we do a lot of thought leadership. My partner is, um, she has a PhD in IO psychology, and so she does a lot in like conferences in our space, lots of speaking. We try to get as much like earned um, media as we can versus like paid. Um, so lots and lots of speaking events at the places where our buyers hang out. And I too am not great at LinkedIn, but we are learning you have to lean, lean into that. And there's lots of like really cool tools out there now that will help you analyze LinkedIn and see, like it'll give you, we're just experimenting with one right now, it's called LinkedElf. Um, but basically like it'll show you where are your competitors, or sorry, who, who these people, where are they engaging with your competitors? So they'll tell you like what posts are they attracted to? It'll just give you some signals around what should you be doing and where can you get more brand um, presence and profile. So I do think LinkedIn is a pretty important tool for sure and probably underutilized for most of us. So. Awesome. Well, thank you, Evan, David, and Kelsey. Um, really appreciated what you brought today. It was a lot of good content. Um, yay. <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, 
Q&A. I mean, we learned a lot of things today. We learned about some tools that you're using, um, HubSpot, uh, Zendesk, and so on. For those of you that don't know a lot about our membership, you do get credits as a member for HubSpot, um, for the social being a member of the Social Innovation Hub. Um, we learned about being more in community, knowing more about your customer, where are they, what are they doing, um, how do they live their lives, and how do you fit um, into that equation. Um, we learned about um, making sure that your product is actually kind of useful, um, learning about what, what, why people say no and why they say yes. Um, you know, that can help with like future referrals. Um, so we learned a lot. I learned a lot. I hope you learned some things too. Um, but I'm curious if there is anything in the audience that you were curious about, any questions that you might have um, for a panel's hair, panelist here. For sure. Uh, maybe I'll give you the mic so we can have you on the recording. Uh, <laughs> so good afternoon. Um, while we while you talk about how important acquisition is, I would like to know because in a very challenging and competitive world, when, regardless of which industry you are in, how do you keep this acquired customers loyal to you? What are your best practices? Oh, I, yeah, I have some thoughts on that. That's a good one. And I think I saw a stat the other day that um, sales in tech are like this. We're in a four year low. So, yeah, it's it's challenging. And um, one thing I'll say, too, I can't stand when people say they have no competitors. That's you have competitors. We all have competitors. And if you don't have a competitor, figure out why they're like, what else are they spending money on? We all have competitors. And if not, your competitor is the status quo, which is nothing. And that's also not great. Um, it's a lot harder or it's a lot easier to sell when there's clearly budget defined versus trying to advocate for a new budget. Personally speaking, that's our, our experience. But to your point, um, we, we, like I said, we emphasize relationships so much. We have a really fulsome customer success program. We meet with all of our clients quarterly um, on top of their experience in the software. We do kind of um, a lot outside of the app because, and I think you know, this has been a really critical learning for us and critical insights into like products we've used and churned. It is really easy to click cancel to a subscription where you've never seen a face. Uh, you know, you said selling is relationships, that's everything. Um, it's really hard for our customers to like get us on the phone and say bye, right? And so you really want to, I just think like delight them at every stage and we just talk about going above and beyond and exceeding ex expectations. And maybe that's not sustainable for every company, but I think when you do that, your customers will stick by you when you have product challenges, when the platform goes down, and that's happened to us, and then it's easy to come back and say, we sincerely apologize, you know what we can deliver on, and this is not that. And so they, that kind of loyalty will get you through, I think, the challenging times, but human relationships, it's big for me. It's a fantastic question. I couldn't agree more with what you just said, Kelsey. The competition is such today, and you brought this up earlier, where your customer has the luxury of choice at all times. They can spend their money somewhere else. They can choose some. Don't think that you've got a product or a feature advantage that no one else can replicate because AI can build software today, right? The barrier to entry is so low for platforms and services and content that we have infinite opportunities to just choose someone else. And so if you're just connected by, like tethered by, you know, the thing that comes off my credit card every month or some feature that we think is our secret sauce, you're probably not in a position to retain customers very well. Uh, you need to be proactive and thoughtful, not reactive and trying to save the business when everybody wants to go to, to somebody else. Um, yeah, I've really put thought into that life cycle management of how are we keeping customers engaged and ideally you want to grow lifetime value, try and find something else of, of, of interest and value to them to add to the relationship over time. I think the only thing I would add is that onboarding process is crucial. A lot of people, like, and, and I know the topic of all this conversation is sales, and sales is important, but you know, once you close the deal, it is so crucial of what is that next step? What's the first 90 days look like? If you have a, you know, if you have a software technology product, like is there someone onboarding and helping people get set up and getting all their employees on? And that's really how you're gonna reduce churn in the long term. And that's 
that's actually, I think, where the relationship starts to build. Like, yes, sales, you are building somewhat of a relationship, but once they've actually given you money and they're a customer, that's when things shift. So I think really think about that onboarding process. How do you make it easy, make it smooth? How do you make people understand your product? And like, I, I think that's just critical amongst all these other things, but that's the only thing I would add. Thank you. Great questions and great, great answers. Um, Um, my question is kind of on the opposite end. So we talked about building customer loyalty. And so what about when you're on the other end and you're in the early stages and you're still looking to get your first few clients? Uh, my question is, what is either, if you've sent a lot of cold emails, so you don't know anyone, what is the best cold email you've received? Or if you've sent a lot of cold emails yourselves, can you tell about a time where you got a major win through cold emailing? Yeah, I've sent a, a ton of cold emails. Um, I, think, I think the common mistake is founders will usually just kind of like, it's almost like they're selling a car. They'll just list all the details. Oh, it has this, It has our product has this, 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 this. And the person just goes delete. Like, whereas I think the best cold emails are about the, the problem or the perceived problem with the person you're reaching out to. And that's why it's important to do prospecting and really understand who are you reaching out to? Like, what's their role? And how does your product actually help them? Does it save them time? Does it save them money? Does it help them hire faster? Whatever that solution is, that's what you should lead with. You should be leading with the solution and what your product helps that person achieve because they read your email and they can envision themselves using it. I think you should also have some, some kind of like brand rubs in there. Like if it's your very first customer, maybe you can kind of talk, you don't have to put the name of the customer, but you could say, oh, some early users of this product have achieved this result just from some, from some credibility. I think there's a lot more to a cold email, but I think just that subtle change is really different. I think get to the point really quickly too. You don't need to say, hope this email finds you well and all this <laughs> stuff. Like just get to the point. What is the problem? What are you solving? And then ask if they're interested to learn more. Um, you know, don't ask for, t hey, can I have an hour or two hours of your time? Can I go for lunch? It's like, hey, can I just, are you interested in learning more? And then make stuff really easy. If it's an in-person meeting, like say, hey, I can meet in this coffee shop in the base of your building or meet at your office or always give people that virtual out as well. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I talked a little bit about this, but I, I'm not um, shy about it. I, we, shameless in the beginning, like shameless around, yeah, like just, you know, our very, very, very first pilot was unpaid. Um, so offered to, you know, totally test, like we needed users, we needed to test our MVP. Um, of course, I wanted to get it paid, they were not willing to pay. And so I was like, okay, we'll do this for free. And that was the last um, unpaid pilot that we did. But always push for paid, by the way, if you can. And, um, but like, you know, you're losing money in this engagement, but you're learning, I'll be able to use your name and branding if everything goes well. And you have to like build those successes on each other. Um, our first US client, I like straight up called, um, called the buyer and I was like, look, we're breaking into the US, I need to land my first US client, give us a small pilot, like I'll highly discount it, just give us a chance. And he was like, sure. And it was just like a phone call, you know? And I was, I was shameless. Like, I think just like, don't be, this is what I meant about creativity. Like, don't be afraid to get creative in the sales process and figure out what they need um, and try to sell it to them, right? And so, yeah, and then, you know, dropping customer names and like e each one helps you build on one another, asking for referrals, asking for references um, from your existing clients. Um, yeah, and like when you when you walk into a room, I think like you said, like you're looking around and you're like, who can I sell to here? And if I can't sell to you, can you give me an introduction? Don't don't feel bad about asking for introductions. Like this is the way of the world, and that's how you're going to build your business. So just be shameless. Put your ego aside. You love your product. You love what you're doing. Share that with the world. Awesome. Um, any any more questions? We have one around the back here. One one moment. Hi, uh, thanks very much for this panel. I, I came to the last one, really liked it. This one's been excellent too. Uh, just a quick question. 
we have a ton of traction. We're an early revenue startup, um, deep tech. You know, we're kind of trailblazing our own industry and and creating our own market. What do you do when you have a ton of traction and you need to actually like close the sale? Like, just I just need you to to sign and and pay. You know, we've got we've got all the traction, but w- w- define w- define traction. Like the pro- they're uh, trialing it right now. No, uh, we're so we we do quantum training, and we've been talking with a number of organizations whose mandate it is to deliver quantum training to the future quantum workforce. Mm-hmm. And so, like, how do we, you know, get them to to just be like, yes, yeah, we, so we want your service. So there's something going on there where they're maybe not they're not seeing the like urgency today, right? And so you have to create that urgency. Um, I don't, you guys probably have good ideas. We're starting to come up against this now that we have venture capital investors, we have bigger growth targets. So we're, we're using like the quarterly, you know, like I gotta make some budget. Like if you can get me a decision by this point, we'll give you a discount. Um, throw in some additional services, discounts, like for sure. And you always start up here and come down and make them feel like they're winning in the negotiation. Um, but yeah, you're probably, they're, you're probably like, they don't feel the urgency to sign right away and you need to make them feel that, right? Like, hey, we have other interests. Like, do you want me to just come back to you when, um, when the timing's right? Like you create the decision point versus waiting, you know, just waiting. You have to force the decision. A uh, couple of psychological tricks. So the perception of scarcity. Your team is limited. You don't have much time. You can take on one more client. You know, it's all optics, right? But stress me out. Create urgency because I just, oh, man, if we don't do this, creates a little FOMO, gets my heart going. And I'm like, oh, maybe somebody better pull the trigger on this deal. Uh, another trick would be just add a sweetener just have something in your back pocket or even a toolkit you know a little quiver of sweeteners that you can add based on pre- previous conversations you're holding something back because you know you have additional margin or a feature or something that you can add in there that would feel pretty special to them i know kelsey's playing that trick all the time in negotiation and whatnot because you know how far you can go but be willing to offer it like enter that negotiation that sales cycle knowing that you've got these things you just haven't revealed them yet and then you know we all feel wonderful you feel like the kindest guy in the world because you brought that to the table and then I better grab that right because now the opportunity is a little bit is a little bit shinier yeah I think scarcity is really effective and hey we have like a limited amount of slots and you know we work with people on a quarterly basis so having some sort of deadline in place. I think too, like a common mistake I see with founders too is like, they'll do the discovery meeting, they'll do the demo, and then they'll just like send a contract or they'll send like an agreement over. Whereas you should really be, every time you're kind of moving or wanting to make a a step further, you should be having a meeting, right? So every time you have a meeting, you should be booking that next meeting, that next call. Because that way you can separate curious people from serious people. And there's people that are just curious that are going to like, not, I I don't mean waste your time in a bad way, but they're just going to kind of go through the whole process. They'll let you lead everything. And they have no intention of actually making a decision or purchasing. And you really want to kind of figure that out. And having like, okay, so we're... um, so it's like, okay, hey, you, like, you've learned about our offering. This is the kind of price point. Uh, how about we have a call in one week and we'll walk through like, the agreement together. And, and then that way you're on the call with them and you can objective handle. So if they have an objection to something, you can kind of handle that on the call instead of you're just kind of firing out agreements and you know, hey, I'm just following up on this. I'm just following up on this. Like you've, you've I'm not saying you lost it, but like that's just not the best way to do it. Always keep those meetings. The real objections will come out, and you can handle them actively on the call. Um, but that's just one tactic. Actually, yeah, I was gonna. That's such a good point. And I would, I now say, if you're getting a contract out and there's nothing in there that you haven't already talked about, red flag. Like when you, by the time you're getting a contract out, the customer is not going to be surprised by anything you put in it because you've already had the discussion so that, you know, they're ready to sign. And I think to your point, if they're like lingering on that, it means they're, they weren't there yet. Um, also, it's so uncomfortable, but ask them. 
you know, what else do you need? What would, what would help get your signature on this? And it, it is uncomfortable, but you'll get to the bottom of like, why is there a pause or why is there maybe a rejection? And ultimately, if you're getting rejections faster, that's a good data point too. By the way, quantum, um, go to the UK too. I think they're more advanced than us there. All right, two, two more it looks like. Um, we talked about, you talked about HubSpot a bit and it comes empty. Um, email addresses. So that concept of drip sending out, you know, in the pipeline and so on. I know LinkedIn, I think you, you know, if you pay for the extra premium, you can get email addresses out of there, I think. Where do you get them from? Um, because nowadays it's not as easy as it used to be, I think. Um, there's one, I'm literally gonna find this. I was talking to someone the other day that said they, I think it's a free tool. Um, hold on, I'm gonna get it for you. It's Hun Hunter Chrome, Hunter Chrome. And it's like an, ex or maybe it's just Hunter and you add it on, hunter.io. You add it on to Google Chrome and it allows you to get people's emails from their domains, um, and I think it's a free tool. I don't know, this guy got my email using that, so. Um, and I was like, how'd you get my email? And he's like, Hunter, <laughs> hunter.io. I was like, okay. Um, but I think like if you're feeling like you're getting lots of emails out and you're not getting responses, like they have to be curated. And I mean, I have a good example of that. We were doing kind of like pay per click on a on a thought leadership piece we have right out out right now in the U.S. on like in like a big training and development um, group, and they give us all the emails. We automatically trigger a campaign like after, and it's only the ones that are hitting that like have budget, are interested, are ready, and so your message like really has to speak to the people who want to buy. And if you feel like you're not getting any of those clicks, then you know there's something like not hitting that's making them not click. To the point where our, like the one, a couple meetings we've had, they're like, I get a ton of spam emails, I hit delete on all of them, but I hit yours because of X, you know? And so get to the bottom of like what that is and what's gonna make them like book because the more you know your audience and your persona, the more likely you are to get. Getting the emails is the easy part, getting them to open is the, the hard part. Um, the tech stack that I've always used, like Sales Nav, LinkedIn Sales Navigator is really good. Uh, from my understanding, unless they've changed it very recently, you can't get emails through LinkedIn. If you add someone on LinkedIn, you can go to their contact info, but it's usually like their personal Gmail and that might piss some people off if you're emailing them there. Um, I use Apollo IO, like there's a lot of good tools, but Apollo is really good. You can do sequences on that. Uh, and it actually just integrates into LinkedIn. So when you're on someone's LinkedIn profile, Apollo will pop up. And um, I'd say email accuracy is quite good, especially as companies get larger. Uh, if it's like a really, really new startup, it's probably not gonna be great, uh, but mid-market and above. And the person's email will be there, usually sometimes phone number, and it'll distinguish if it's like a mobile or like a work number. Uh, I find that the most effective, and then Apollo has good HubSpot integration, so you can actually just pull that person in. Uh, and I think those three tools together is is very reasonable price point, and you can use Apollo IO on a free tier pretty good, too. Awesome. Thank you, folks. Um, we could prob probably could do one more question if there is one. If there's not, there that's okay. Okay, great. Last question. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've all been very, uh, very informative. I've got a question um, about how to integrate a newer product into the market. And this product, I would like to see fly really fast because if not, then other people could mimic it and make a lot of money from it. And this is a really social-minded product. So if I could maybe um, ask you either um, would it be better to just in-house sell? And if that doesn't work on a fast momentum, then what would you recommend in order to make a larger impact where the sales are higher and faster? Would you recommend like a marketing firm then or any suggestions along that line? Thanks. 
Uh, yeah, with outsourcing, I'm not a huge fan of that. I, I think if you're looking, if you're like a small team and you're startup and you're trying to push a product, I think like partnerships are really effective. Um, you know, like again, like we mentioned, organizations that might already have an established network. Like, I don't know, like if, if I was just using a hypothetical example, like Benevity, and you're trying to push to charities, then, you know, I would be approaching like United Way or like other organizations like that and help and creating a package or kind of a B2B to be selling kind of process of utilizing partners that can really push your product. Um, cause otherwise you're always going to be constrained, which is your time. Like you, you can't sell to 10,000, 3000 people. If you kind of have like a product that you need to onboard them from a B2B perspective, B2C is different. Um, but I think that's what I would be looking at from B2B instead of like going to marketing agency, spending all their money, spending all your money with them. They also will need to learn your product and how to sell your product. So there's a scaling component there. I would just be going to kind of partners that are out there that you know can maybe access like a thousand or a hundred folks that you're looking to get in front of. Yeah, I think that's tremendous advice actually. Try and do as much as you can without external influence, but realistically there could be a skills deficit internally as well. So there's probably some out of house expertise that you would need to acquire. The challenge would be capitalizing all of it, right? Like where's the money come from to do all this? So we probably don't know enough about um, what you're doing and what that product is to make, because we have to be very channel specific, right? It's, can, can I just run Google ads and do all this? Well, maybe if there's demand for that and if there's not a lot of competition for it, then maybe it's the right channel. So you have to get pretty specific, I think, about you know channel strategy and, and how that's executed. Try as much earned media as possible and partner channels, it's just pre-baked. They don't really have to know it. There isn't like a scientific or a technical expertise that they would require. If you can enter through channels like that, that don't require a ton of product knowledge, I think that would be the most effective way for you at this stage. Awesome, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, did you feel like your question was answered? Did you have a follow up? You're good? Okay, great. Um, well, thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate um, your attentiveness. Um, and we had some great questions there as well. If you're interested in learning more about the Social Innovation Hub and how we can support um, your venture, feel free to come and chat with me. As I mentioned, some of the tools that they mentioned, you get a discount by being a member here. Um, you also get access to space and kind of expert advice as well. So if you're really trying to look at your sales um, strategies for yourself um, and your business and what you need to do next, um, we might have some resources for you as well.